health and climate change. I think that we have something in common. We want to we want science to help the society, and much of the effort we make has to do with finding the means to uh, provide information and evidence in order to inform decision making and public policies. And there's also an effort whereby researchers scientists and academicians and uh, aim to uh, build bridges with other sectors of society in order to, to do more advocacy work. And in this sense, Adi del Valle University, uh, we have been working on exactly that. We want to we believe that this interest, this event is very interesting. And we also trust that the results of this study and other studies will be able to be implemented by every stakeholder in the society, but in particular, those that lead uh, some sectors in our country in order to do advocacy work. with us today. Many of you have been on both sides, trying to impact public policy through research. And today, you're here addressing those research outcomes to strengthen government actions across different initiatives. So without further ado, on behalf of our community, I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank the IAI and the Lancet Countdown Initiative for <laughs> bringing together three groups of scientists with different roles. The youngest ones, you have more years ahead of you. Others were involved in preparing the Lancet Countdown study and others who are part of the panel, more seasoned and trying to use scientific diplomacy for advocacy and fulfilling the role that they have to do. Consider Guatemala your home, and please let us know if there's anything the members of the community can do for you. And we hope the results translate into action to contribute to the 19 countries and everybody else. Welcome again, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Moreno, for your words. We will now listen to Thaisa Vila. She will be joining us on video and she is the editor of the regional health uh, Lancer journal. She couldn't join us in person, but she has sent her greetings. We hope technology is with us today. Health Americas to launch the highly anticipated 2023 countdown report on climate change and health in Latin America. The 2023 countdown report analyzes 24 indicators that track the relationship between health and climate change in the region, highlighting the growing exposure of this population to changing climate conditions and harms. The findings of this report are very clear. Latin American countries must urgently complete robust assessment of potential climate risks. By understanding the specific vulnerabilities and potential impacts, policymakers can make informed decisions and implement effective strategies to protect the health and well being of their populations. And on that note, it's very important to recognize that climate change disproportionately impacts systematically marginalized populations, indigenous communities, rural populations, low-income individuals, and other vulnerable groups often bear the brunt of the adverse effects of climate change. 
the Lesser Regional Health Americas is truly honored to have been chosen as the platform to disseminate this crucial data. As a high-level medical journal, we are committed to advancing knowledge and promoting evidence-based solutions to improve health outcomes. So we firmly believe that the research in this report has the power to shape policies, influence practice, and ultimately save lives. Our hope is that this report will serve as a catalyst for change. We call upon research community, policymakers, and stakeholders to join forces in utilizing this invaluable resource to support and inspire data-driven action. In closing, I would like to express my gratitude to the dedicated researchers who contributed to this report. Your commitment to advancing our understanding of the complex relationship between climate change and health is commendable. I would also like to extend my thanks to the Regional Health Americas editorial team and the outstanding peer reviewers who made it possible to shape and bring this report to life. Let us all seize this opportunity to make a difference. Let's work together to ensure that this research is not just another publication, but it's a catalyst for meaningful change. The Lancet Regional Health Americas stands ready to support and collaborate with all of those who share our vision for a healthier, more actable, and sustainable Latin America. Thank you all. Agradecemos el mensaje de la doctora Thaisa Vila via video. We want to thank Dr. Thaisa Vila for your words. I now want to welcome Stella Hartinger, the core director of the Latin American Center on Excellence in Climate Change and Health and director of the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change South America. She will present the Lancet Countdown Report for Latin America. Madam, you have the floor. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> thank you, Anna. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you to the university for inviting us, for allowing us to use this platform to present the report of the Lancet Countdown on Climate Change in Latin America. This is the first time I am presenting this report in person since 2019. Unfortunately, of course, the pandemic made it impossible and we have had remote meetings so far. We've chosen Guatemala for many reasons. One, because Anna and I have been one of our main partners. So having been part of the report last year and now having become allies, Anna, we know that this is the right place to, to say it or to, to, to communicate it officially. Now let's, let's go to the report for Latin America. The reports changed. Last year, we worked on the South American report. Now we're working on the Latin American report. That means we have included the five Central American countries and Mexico. Apparently, the U.S. doesn't want Mexico, so you, we are bringing it here. We all speak the same language, right? So it makes sense. There are two pillars for this report, and this is how it is framed. We first looked at what happened in terms of climate, issues, environmental issues in 2023 and the political aspect. In terms of climate climate issues, we see temperatures rising. We continue to see cyclones, hurricanes, and so on. In terms of politics, we now have the first health day at COP28, where 140 countries are now committed to establishing climate resilient health systems. The global stock take shows that we really are far from the path that we should be on if we want to achieve the cap commitments. So the purpose of this report is twofold. So one, what do we do as Latin American countries to work to adapt to understand what's happening? Before that, let me say that the Lancet Countdown Latin America is an independent and multidisciplinary cooperation. We have 23 academic inst 
institutions and UN agencies, 34 authors coming from the 17 countries of the region we are uh, a subject of study. Someone asked, when did the initiative start? Well, long ago, but the first time that we were asked what happens with Latin American countries, South American countries, that started in 2020, and this is our second iteration of the report. Unfortunately, considering the giants around the world, sometimes our countries go unnoticed in the global report, but it is also important to stress what's going on in this region. We looked at the five working groups of the Lancet countdowns. Last year, we worked on five indicators that were sorted out in terms of impact, adaptation, uh, plans, mitigation, and health co benefits, economy and finance, and political and um, public commitment. We have 34 indicators this year, nine are new. Two were co-authored by regional authors. One of them, which is so relevant, is the loss of vegetable coverage or land use changes in many of our countries. And we have seven global indicators that we have added for this year. So what do we see? Well, first of all, that the impacts on climate change continue to affect populations and the health of our population across Latin America. That has not changed. Unfortunately, trends show that this will be exacerbated. So the first indicators that this shows is heat exposure. There's been an average increased summer temperature from 0 0.38 Celsius compared to the baseline we used to, to work with. Now, these anomalies are completely different from one country to the next. Paraguay, 1.9, Argentina, 1.2, Uruguay, 0.9, Guatemala, 0.67. So we are now already seeing temperature increases. And as you know, temperature increases might lead to our most vulnerable populations being exposed to these increases in temperature. How? Heat waves. Heat waves are defined as two or more consecutive days where temperature stays over a certain threshold. And that indicator will show or will provide evidence that the most vulnerable people by being exposed will be disproportionately impacted. What do we mean? For example, the elderly people over the age of 60 with comorbidities or that have other diseases might be, while exposure increases, they might not only go to shock but also lead to death. What we've seen is that in children under the age of one, there's been an increase in the number of days when they've been exposed to heat waves, and that's increasing almost to 148%. In Guatemala, this increment accounts for about 500% or even more. The elderly have also increased the number of days of exposure to heat waves, and in Guatemala, this increase is... Uh, around 500% or over. That translates into an increment or an increase in mortality rates. For all the countries in the region, mortality rates have increased 140%, while it is up almost 200% in Guatemala. And of course, this varies from one country to the next. Now, another indicator, unfortunately, we won't cover them all, but another one is climate uh, suitability for the transmission of infectious diseases. So we know that dengue transmission has increased by 54% as well. In Guatemala, this is around 70%. So what does that mean? It means that the weather in Guatemala is making it easier for the vector to reproduce, causing the disease. Such increases also go hand in hand with the increase of the disease in the different countries. So the report shows three distinct messages that we want to convey to decision makers. First, Latin American countries require intersectoral public policy to increase climate resilience, reduce social inequalities, and enhance the health of our population and reduce GAG emissions. Why are we focusing on an intersectoral policies? We always 
blame the health system or the Ministry of Public Health as they provide no answers to certain if uh, extreme events or diseases like dengue. But unless we work with other sectors or other ministries, these changes will not take hold. In Peru, for example, we've seen increases for the past two years in the prevalence of dengue last year due to the cyclone and this year for El Nino. But unless we change housing, access to drinking water, clean sanitation, those changes will not happen. And this will, um, stay uh, on and on. So what about indicators for adaptation? Well, first of all, countries should carry out impact assessments, vulnerability and adaptation. Brazil and Guatemala were the only countries in Latin America that completed the assessment under the WHO survey. That does not mean that other countries have not taking the evaluation, they just not reported it. Argentina and Panama published their assessment in 2019 and 2021. Many times these adaptation and vulnerability assessments lead to or set things in motion. For example, in Argentina, they have the program for preparedness and support for the Green Climate Fund. Or in Brazil, for example, they devoted a certain funding, they described adaptation measures, and in many cases that led to the creation of the HNAPs, the National Adaptation Plans on Health. Brazil, Chile, and Uruguay are the only countries that have um, worked on this. We don't have the same uh, information for Guatemala. Likewise, I, I, and, and that is at the national level. But now what happens at city level? As you know, the impact of climate change it is true we're going to evaluate them country level, but the ones that have to provide answers or respond are cities. So we are also looking at impact assessments that cities have carried out on climate change. And it is very interesting because this is a voluntary assessment. So only 268 municipalities across Latin America have volunteered to this risk assessment. That accounts for 1.7% of all municipalities in the region. If we wanted to use more simple terms, we are not prepared to tackle climate change at city level. We are now looking at a national perspective rather than a city outlook. In Guatemala, only four countries have responded to this risk assessment out of the potential 300 and 54 administrative units, and out of these, not all of them have done the assessment, only have, but however, once they do, we are able to see what they're facing. In South America, we're looking at infectious diseases, floods, uh, urban floods. In Central America, we're thinking about extreme rainfall, heat, flood, infectious diseases. So that shows us the route that cities should take for adaptation. So these are the assessments. Now, what is happening in terms of implementing or enforcing adaptation measures? In a scoping conducted last year about adaptation, and to see how much countries had adapted or what they would see in NDCs or NAPs or HNAPs, were they actually implementing? Was health really a cross-cutting topic to all sector, Ministry of Housing, Agriculture, were they considering health issues? Another aspect is whether funding is available. Do you have progress indicators? Do you have a leading figure at the ministry and the baseline for all of them was quite nice, but they had no progress indicators. They did not have a focal point at the ministries to implement the mitigation measures and they did not have funding either. So this all translates into indicators. One of the indicators is green urban spaces. What that might lead to very quickly is to reducing air pollution and stop the increase or heat waves. And this should be done 
in the municipalities, but of the urban centers we have assessed, none of them has a high degree of green areas. Club centers have moderate degrees. There are no substantial changes in the region, meaning we don't have the initiatives or people don't feel that the initiatives are important or why we should be implementing them. And Colombia, Nicaragua and Venezuela are the only countries where the green areas have increased, but not enough for them to be considered a, a, a high level. The second uh, main finding, Latin American countries need to accelerate in a, the energy transition to improve well-being, reduce uh, poverty and air contamination to have positive economic consequences. What is this? We have a number of indicators. Number one, we need to decarbonize energy energy systems. We can see that carbon related energy generation has increased by 2% points. Honduras, Mexico, Brazil, Panama and other countries have increased their level. And we're all saying, why is no one doing anything at the COP? Why are we not making progress? Because our governments are not either. Also low carbon energy sources, they have increased. But that's not the issue in the region, because in the region, we already have 56% of electricity generation from low carbon energies. What would happen if we were the first region? What would happen if we were the first region to reach a 70% or 80%? We shouldn't wait for other regions to actually lead. We need to start thinking about our region as a change, as a change maker. Also, we have talked a lot about, we talk a lot about gender, about fair energy transitions in the region. Okay, we talk about this, but what does this mean? We have an indicator, which is domestic energy use. In the region, 19.5 uh, uh, of, uh, in Latin America, use dirty fossil fuels or biomass. But let's have a look at the rural areas 46 in central america 46 percent of the people living in rural areas use biomass energy to cook in south america it's 23 percent nicaragua guatemala in rural areas 85 percent are using biomass in south america peru and paraguay over 50 percent use biomass for cooking so what are we talking about when we talk about a fair transition this is what we're talking about we need to change this so we, sh we can't work alone. The energy sector should focus on these figures and say, nationally, if someone cooks with dirty oil, it means that they're exposed to 145 micrograms of uh, uh, particle matter. And this is, this is a material that causes uh, respiratory diseases among children. Uh, rural areas, 163 and urban 108 and people that uh, cook with uh, clean technologies they use around 55 mi micrograms per cubic meter the who considers that the level should be only five so we need to remember who are the most vulnerable it's usually women and this is where the gender issue comes in when we consider uh, premature mortality as per the air quality. Uh, for 2020, uh, for, by 2020, we had 123 premature deaths and almost a 4% increase. Who has increased? Central America, Chile, and Colombia. As you can see, we we lack some independent disaggregated details. I don't know if it's because they don't monitor air quality in Central America, or maybe they have the whole figures because the information is excessive. This is something that, that we can still start, that we can start considering so that we can um, cover these information gaps. Mortality rates are the highest in Peru and Chile. Uh, actually, uh, especially in uh, Lima, Peru and La Paz, Bolivia. If we were to show something even harder, we can say that given to premature death connected with 
atmospheric air contamination, the country loses almost uh, 0.61% of the GDP, which equals 6.6, .6, the, the income of 6.6 million people in 2020. And this is a kind of thing that we need uh, decision makers to be able to see to make the necessary changes. This is one of our indicators. This is the uh, loss of tree cover and health. In South America, the use of uh, the land is changing because of uh, the demand for raw material, forest deforestation or agricultural land expansion, which is happening mainly in Brazil and Paraguay. What's happening in these countries, the countries with the highest loss, loss is Brazil, uh, Brazil, Bolivia, Paraguay, Argentina and Colombia. Why? In particular in Brazil because of cattle raising. So we are destroying carbon sinks, the Amazon, but we're also introducing not, uh, irresponsible agricultural practices that include that increase methane emissions. This indicator will improve over time. We were just talking about the one health issue. And it's something that we find very interesting but it's difficult to include in the report. But this loss of tree cover is also connected with the increase of infectious diseases and the contact we have with them. Uh, I know that I don't have much more time, but I can tell you here in the agricultural section, we're responsible for almost 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. That's twice as much compared to the rest of the world. But what's going on in Latin America? We love eating beef. So there's a lot of premature death that is connected with beef consumption, also the consumption of dairy products and cured meats. Leading countries, Brazil and Argentina, how many deaths given this premature, uh, given this consumption? 155,000 deaths a year on account of uh, dairy products and processed red beef. Well, I'm close to the end. The, th the third main finding of the report is that countries need to increase climate funding through financial commitments and multilateral development banks in order to uh, promote development. I can tell you that uh, clean energy investment has increased um 6.8 percent higher than in other years the investment has uh been greater than investment in fossil fuels but the gcf has given us 60 percent less funds to do our work and conduct our adaptation studies only 11.6 percent is used for health topics. So we cannot advance this if there is no fin financial commitment from the country and from outside. What happens if the total net subsidy of fossil fuels is 23, uh, th uh, 23 billions? And this amount equals the uh, health expen ex uh, expenditure in, in the countries. So we need to decide what we're spending on. But I can also tell you that uh, financial losses on account of extreme events amount to $16 billion, uh, not 0.28 the GDP of the GDP in the region. 93% of those losses are not insured. Unlike what happens in developed countries, when we lose things, we lose everything. And this is what has happened, especially in Brazil. What can I tell you that if war, uh, heat waves, mortality rates um, are equal to 450 people uh, annually, but this has been calculated, sorry, the income of 451,000 people annually. Then there is the loss of income regarding work uh being unable to work and this is 1.34 percent of the gdp or 1.78 billion dollars and this greatly affects agriculture and production sorry and construction and in guatemala the funds the money we lose focuses on the agricultural sector so these are economic losses 
but uh, we need to pay attention to the necessary impact. In the same way, uh, we have the political and public commitment. And with these indicators, we try to reflect what the population thinks and how we make these changes. We need to remember that we need the commitment of, of the media, scientists, the governments uh, in the UN debate, the companies, and this cannot just happen. The aim of our report is to provide scientific information so the decision makers implement all this. We're not here to uh, create public policies. We, we just want to provide information. Uh, regarding government commitment, only four countries talk about climate change and the intersection with health in that debate. If we work with the commitment uh, of the media last year, 1,260 papers were published, a 63% uh, increase. But the climate change and health um, interface is not mentioned. Also, we have increased the number of, uh, sorry, the number of scientific articles has increased, but we're still 4% of the global literature. So we're not truly represented as a region. We need to start researching and working on adaptation mitigation so that the changes we want to achieve can be seen. Sorry, I've spoken a bit too long. Thank you. Muchas gracias, doctora Hartinger, por esta muy informativa presentación. Thank you, Dr. Hartinger, for this presentation with so much information. So now we have the next item of the agenda. We will have the short presentations made regarding science diplomacy. Uh, and we have here the IAI Step Fellows. I would like to invite Kim Port and also step fellows because they will be sharing their findings. Thank you. Gracias, Edwin. Buenas tardes, estimados, estimadas, miembros. Good afternoon, everyone. Dear members of the government, vice ministers, community of the UVG step fellow program. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. We've just arrived from Antigua and we attended a leadership meeting with a group of almost 40 fellows from the Americas. As Edwin has said, we have here 19 nationalities of people working in 15 countries in the Americas on several topics regarding global environmental change. We're trying to learn and being leaders. We want to be this bridge between science and decision making. And we want to work with different, different members of the community, including uh, government officials. So it's a pleasure to be here with you today to present these science diplomacy projects that we have been uh, implemented the, during this year of professional development. We have focused on science diplomacy, communication, and TD leadership. These are projects that are part of groups, uh, teams that have different members from different countries. They have chosen different topics and they will be uh, introducing their findings. First of all, I would like to introduce Amanda Coles from the United States so that she can present the results of her team. Thank you, Amanda, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, on behalf of all of the STEP fellows, I'd like to thank our, our gracious Guatemalan hosts, this has been a really special visit and we are honored to be here and part, be part of the program today. My name is Amanda Colts and I'm a faculty member at the University of Texas at Austin. I will be presenting on behalf of the United Nations Ocean Conference Stakeholder Meeting Group. Um, so human health and well-being is intimately tied to ocean health. 
The ocean nurtures 80% of life on our planet. It generates half of the oxygen that we breathe every day. It absorbs a quarter of all carbon dioxide emissions. Oceans provide food, jobs, and energy. They are truly our lifeline. But these critical ecosystem services are at risk due to climate change, um, plastic pollution, and other forms of anthropogenic disturbance. Um, the United Nations Ocean Conference, UNOC, aims to support action to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, um, uh, and uh, marine resources for sustainable development. The goal of our project was to compare the outcome documents from the last two um, ocean conferences, which were in 2017 and 2022, and to analyze the outcomes of these um, documents to look for commonalities, common messages, changes, um, and specifically to identify gaps and priorities that could be used to inform a stakeholder meeting that's coming up later this year, hosted by Costa Rica ahead of next year's 2025 UN Ocean Conference that will be co-hosted by Costa Rica and France. Um, before I get into the, some of the um, opportunities and challenges, um, we can say that the one common message from the 2017 and 2022 outcomes is that uh, the time to act is now. There is no time to waste um, if we want to ensure the long-term sustainability and resilience of our ocean systems. So um, this is a, a very quick presentation, so I'll just very briefly go through um, a few of the opportunities and challenges. Um, so first, um, there is a real opportunity to integrate um, the priorities of the UN Ocean Conference across multiple international frameworks and policy, in policy initiatives that are ongoing right now. Some of these include the UN Ocean Decade, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, and specifically with regards to the um, Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that was passed in 2022. There are also ongoing efforts to address plastic pollution in marine and terrestrial environments, and so there's an opportunity there to develop a more comprehensive strategy to address plastic pollution in the marine environment. There is also um, a lot of movement in the One Health space globally and internationally right now, and there's an opportunity to expand uptake of the One Health approach in marine environments, um, which recognizes the interconnectedness of uh, people, animals, and ecosystems. Um, and lastly, the um, one that we wanted to um, really target for attention that is a commonality across both of these 2017 and 22 documents is that there's an opportunity to broaden stakeholder engagement to include more voices and more perspectives from indigenous and local communities. Of course, there are many ongoing challenges. These are big, massive problems. They're transdisciplinary challenges, and they need to incorporate a lot of different kinds of people and sectors. Some of the um, major challenges include um, keeping commitments to national action plans. That's a really important one and a common theme um, across the last few years of ocean conferences. There are also technological, innovative, and capacity building challenges, which we also see as opportunities for moving forward. Um, there are challenges and opportunities for integrating local and indigenous knowledge, fostering public-private partnerships, um, developing a digital ocean data hub, and creating an ocean health innovation fund. Okay. So this is a work in progress, as many of the projects that you'll hear about today are. Um, but overall, our, our project aims to explore advancements in policy, technology, and international cooperation around ocean health and sustainability, with the overall goal of helping to um, develop a product that will inform this um, stakeholder meeting hosted by Costa Rica in November of this year prior to um, an anticipation of the 2025 UN Ocean Conference that will be happening next year. Um, but this, is, this has been um, a real privilege to be able to work with these colleagues, and it's a great example of how a science diplomacy approach can support action on addressing transdisciplinary global issues at the nexus of climate change, health, and biodiversity. So, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Naftali John, and I am from the University of the West Indies. And I will be presenting on behalf of my group on El Nino and agriculture. 
And this is in the Caribbean and Central America, and we'll be exploring the implications for food security. Okay, so let's talk about a shared experience from 2009 or 2010. Many countries in Central America and the Caribbean experienced severe drought towards the end of 2009. So if you were in Costa Rica, El Salvador, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, or Grenada, you may have experienced a significant decline in rainfall, and this was exacerbated by El Nino. So we saw bushfires, a decline in agricultural productivity, and many were forced to ration water resources. So just to bring it home in Guatemala, 2.5 million people were affected. And the consequences included severe malnutrition, job losses in the coffee industry, crop, crop dis destruction, and more. And what these pictures are showing are the consequences of El Nino in the region. So first, this quote, Latin America and the Caribbean is the world's breadbasket and lungs. And this quote kind of demonstrates the vital ecosystem services and the economic activity in the region and how important it is to be protected. So from our study, we did a project. We were looking at policies, vulnerabilities in the region. And we saw that policies varied from country to country with some countries having um, very complex um, advanced frameworks in integrated disaster risk management and climate and agriculture and other countries were lacking. So across the region we saw very high vulnerability from things like pre-existing conditions like water scarcity and agriculture decline. And in terms of drought and El Nino, there were severe economic impacts um, like reduction in agricultural exports and loss of employment. And this has implications for food insecurity, like a decline in the availability and the affordability of locally produced crops. And in turn, health complications due to the increase in consumption of processed foods. So what do we need to do? What we decided to suggest was a multifaceted approach to adaptation and resilience building with respect to climate and agriculture. And this needs a, um, collaboration between government entities, communities, scientists, and we need more sustainable practices and climate resilience strategies. And this is to protect the livelihoods of the persons that are directly involved in agriculture. And we found this through our desk review, looking at existing vulnerabilities, policies, practices, in Barbados, Jamaica, Mexico, Panama, and Trinidad and Tobago. And so we have a policy brief, which is in progress, but we came up with several recommendations under several themes. So our first theme is enhancing policy assessment. And what we're suggesting is regularly reviewing agriculture and adaptation policies and using research and data from different countries and regional institutions to facilitate this. And this kind of leads into developing a regional policy framework that kind of uh, unionizes or harmonizes our approach or strategy to dealing with El Nino. And then that falls under the theme of expanding policy scope. And then with this, with this um, information and with this policy framework we can in turn strengthen policy implementation in the different countries. So even though we have different national circumstances, we can still have a joint approach through science diplomacy. Thank you.
Hola, buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Mi nombre es María Schmuckler. Good afternoon, I am Maria Schmuckler. I am a AI fellow and I will be presenting on behalf of my team. Pablo Sagüesa from Chile, Laila Sandrioni, she's a AI fellow, and Miriam Hurt from the government of Canada. The title of our project is the analysis of uh, local community and indigenous uh, people's committees in international or multilateral organizations. To begin, I want to share the words of Alberto. Alberto is part of the rural movement in Cordoba in Argentina. And this is what he told me in a transdiscipline workshop no lo not, not, not long ago. And he said that a group of biologists came to research put together with us the situation of mountain lions in our land. In their results, they said that we were to blame for the reduction in the number of animals. These outcomes were presented in a Congress and they were mentioning us as poachers. And we are not poachers. We are only defending our animals and our production. We have lived with mountain lions all of our lives and we will continue to do so. We know how to do it. So the challenge is to how to change that outlook and open up spaces for decision making and participation where we can bring together people from the local communities and indigenous populations across the Americas. And we really have an open and fair space for communication. So the first item that we try to address is how these spaces function right now in international organizations where they bring uh, indigenous peoples and uh, rural communities together. So although they are quite diverse, they managed to bring together local communities and indigenous communities thanks to the equality and inclusiveness uh, policies of many of these international organizations. They set up panels, committees, platforms, task forces, uh, round tables to allow for the participation and to hear other voices, basically. This is also part of the pressure and the trajectory of indigenous peoples in their search for uh, participation. Although we found different examples, we also saw that there are top-down approaches to these spaces. They are standardized, they follow certain models, and they do not necessarily listen to the indigenous communities or rural communities that will take part in these spaces. So indigenous leaders claim for that acknowledgement and are discontent with the fact that they are tied to local communities as they are one single group, as if they are presenting a homogeneous voice. They explain that their knowledge system, their trajectories and ontologies are different, and therefore they should have different spaces for participation. We looked at historical data and systematized cases. One was the UNESCO Local Indigenous Knowledge uh, Systems, UNF, Triple CC, Local Communities, Indigenous Peoples Platform, and the Fund for the Development of Indigenous Peoples in Latin America and the Caribbean. We also interviewed Indigenous Peoples uh, representatives, Ramiro Batsin here in Guatemala, Lisa Kopikaluk and Anne Simpson from Canada. We talked to different experts in the matter and um, held different debates among our group. Our latest reflections, and um, we are still working on this, both local communities and indigenous peoples must participate in, dial in, in dialogue in these type of organizations and multilateral and international fora. They have to participate as experts in this conversation, we need to find common ground to make this debate possible considering diversity. And one of the questions that is still unanswered, we believe, is how can we build participatory spaces where different ways of being and being in the world have 
enough agency for decision making. The IAI has taken on the challenge and we are working on how to allow for greater participation and indigenous representatives and representatives of local communities and experts. We are very interested in listening to their opinions and their, their perspectives. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Good afternoon. So my name is Bhuvanesh Avasti. I work with the Government of Canada. I have my colleagues here also from Canada, and a colleague who works on this project is based in the US. We're going to talk about, in our project, a Pan-American framework for science, based on science diplomacy for AI and climate change. So let me bring you back to this city or this country. So today, we are in this city of, <coughs> of Guatemala, where we have quite a few volcanoes that are likely to erupt. But we do not know at what stage or at what point of time they might erupt. What if I tell you that there's a possibility to have a technology, perhaps an advanced technology like AI, that can perhaps predict the likelihood with some certainty and also mitigations of natural disasters like climate change. So our project focuses on using AI to predict and to mitigate and to address climatic disasters. We focus on specific countries in our case, uh, particularly four countries from the global north and south, United States and Canada, as well as Chile and Brazil. Now, when we talk about uh, AI, essentially a lot of AI policy is nationalistic, sovereignty reasons as well as data generative reasons. At the same time, and it is based on sciences, which are mostly based on infrastructure, data, and talent, at the same time, Global challenges like climate change require international efforts, specifically in the context of diplomacy that requires multilateral action, collaboration, international regulatory standards. So we looked at these four countries in the science diplomacy framework. We examined the case studies for these countries through a stakeholder mapping exercise, and we identified certain challenges. For instance, we found there's an absence of measurable and achievable objectives and an absence of formal governance structures. We also found inadequacies in monitoring and evaluation procedures, AI adoption in the public sector, and capacity limitations. So in the spirit of this fellowship, as well as a science diplomacy, we propose a solution, a pan-American framework for AI that combines the infrastructure, the data, the talent, and the governance perspectives. Data are often national in focus, as I mentioned, limiting the feasibility and the effectiveness of international projects. And AI for climate solutions benefit from large and diverse data sets, especially sharing those data sets, and that requires a global framework. Thank you very much. Hola, muy buenas tardes a todos. Eh, feliz de estar aquí. Good afternoon, everyone. I am very happy to be here. I'm Luz Zumba Garcia. I'm from Puerto Rico. I'm an AI fellow, but also a fellow for the AAAS. I'm based in Washington, D.C. This is a very personal work, and this is really our passion. My colleagues are here with me, Brian Lung and Dr. Valentina Hernandez, who helped work with me in this project. I would have loved to go after her because we are speaking about the One Health, the One Health approach to tackle the non-financial losses. It, in line to what you mentioned. So what are financial losses? These are the adverse effects of climate change that might not be minimized to climate adaptation, including the loss of traditional livelihoods, cultural heritage, biodiversity. That's something else that Dr. mentioned. 
and they also imply different ethical considerations of the loss of life, migration, and health impact. These non-financial losses and damages are on the spotlight or have been in the spotlight because of all of the conversations on climate change. Usually we focus more on financial losses, the ones that we can see here. And that is something that was discussed during COP27 under Article 28, where a fund for loss and damage was allocated. But now what happens with those non-financial loss and damage that sometimes are even more significant than financial ones, in my opinion. And that's the challenge. How do we measure financial, economic, or non-monetary losses against those that are non-economic losses? How do we measure that damage when it comes to people, societies, and the environment? How can we develop public policy and allocate funds that will target this particular challenge. <clears throat> and that is a critical part of the debate on climate justice that needs to be addressed nowadays. When researching literature on how to go about it, I'm in the health field and I wanted to include health aspect in these non-financial losses. So I started looking for communities in Latin America and we found literature on uh, an indigenous rural community in Oaxaca, Mexico. And the literature spoke about the COVID-19 pandemic and how the pandemic exposed those vulnerabilities, problems with waste management, water quality, things that not only impacted the physical health of those populations, but also their mental health and social practices and well-being. So we evaluated the COVID-19 response in those communities in Oaxaca, Mexico, and how the different effects of climate change were impacting people's mental health. We wanted to associate this to the One Health approach. We're speaking about environmental, animal, and human health. We, following the WHO model, we saw that when we speak about the impact on water quality, there's also a possibility for the dissemination of infectious diseases as a result of water quality issues. And that also leads to, well, more pandemic, more health problems, not just for the rural communities, but around the world. Another thing that we observed in this community in Oaxaca was the biodiversity degradation affecting mental health, stress levels, and it also has a negative impact on of the social determinants of health, which are also very important. Now, that loss in culture, in different forms of life that also impacts mental health, stress in local and indigenous communities. Now, let's focus on biodiversity, because that was one of the most widespread aspect in these rural communities. How does biodiversity affect health responses and different um, aspects across the community? So this is an ideal situation when we have a well-balanced biodiversity, everything will, works well from zoonosis, social aspects, the propagation of infectious diseases. It is all well balanced. Now, when biodiversity is not balanced anymore, we will start seeing the dissemination of infectious diseases, mental stress, social stress. And that's something that we observe in this community in Oaxaca and in other local and indigenous communities in Latin America. Now, a scientist, as scientists that are connected to public policy and diplomacy, we want to issue recommendations. I am a scientific communicator, so to me, it is very important to advocate for this. 
it feels very personal to me. We <laughs> divided the recommendations in different categories. First, access to medical sanitation services. We need to develop a uh, comprehensive epidemiological surveillance systems, not just for human beings, but animals and environment. Acknowledge the importance of traditional healers or OH doctors because they are critical to these cultures. Preserve biodiversity. Promoting sustainable agricultural practices and strengthening uh, ecosystem conservation and the conservation of uh, key species. Also, awareness raising, promoting interdisciplinary collaboration, which we are doing as IAI fellows, supporting medical care from a holistic perspective, not just considering uh, the, uh, some factors, we need to consider culture as well. And finally, comprehensive policies and approaches, integrating this one health perspective when we are working with policies that have to do with the impacts of climate change, how climate change affects animal health, environmental health and human health. And to do this, we need to promote international cooperation to improve our response capacity. Regarding what we're doing, which uh, we have just published an, an op-ed on Latin America 21, uh, talking about how One Health can help us with this loss and damage issue. And we're also writing a policy brief for policymakers in Mexico and Latin America. Because there are indigenous rural communities everywhere in Latin America, and this applies to everyone. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Gabriela Duarte. I work with the Brazilian Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service. And I'm going to talk on behalf of the Urban Green Infrastructure for Climate Adaptation Group, which we are all listed here and all present here uh, today. Uh, our work is, uh, has a focus on the Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so here we have a photo of the city of Medellin. Excuse my accent here. Uh, in the same spot, the same place, it was a street three years ago. So Medellin has this amazing uh, initiative of restoring 70 hectares of green spaces with by, by planting more than 800,000 trees, which led to the reduction uh, of two uh, degrees Celsius in the temperature in the region in less than three years. So we, as a group, start wondering if this kind of initiatives that lead to uh, climate resilience can be replicated uh, in the rest of the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of climate issues, and, and, but there are solutions. So we, uh, this work is uh, in progress as well. And we are reaching out to people implicated in, the, in green infrastructure projects. And our action plan is to use this uh, online questionnaires to evaluate in, uh, in what way this, um, this projects relate to the climate change. Uh, we also want our, uh, are analyzing their answers and uh, trying to find commonalities, lessons learned, and their challenges. Uh, we want also to share the knowledge so we can try to, so cities, other cities can try to replicate what the, uh, they have done. What we have done so far as a group is was, it was this uh, extensive literature reveal and uh, we analyze what were the stakeholders involved in this kind of projects. We also developed the, the questionnaire in three different languages. And we, also, we are also reaching out 
to actors uh, involved in, in green infrastructure of several cities throughout Latin America. And we, what we are going to do next is uh, this analysis and systematization of their responses and uh, develop a report on, on these topics. And the idea is to understand their perspectives, their challenges, and their solutions. So that's it. Thank you for all for the listening. Buenas tardes a todas las autoridades, buenas tardes a todos los presentes. Mi nombre es Carlos Morales, vengo del Ministerio de Ciencia. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Carlos Morales. I come from the Ministry of Science, Technology, Knowledge and Innovation from Chile, and with Fane Ramos, who could not be here, Angela Atanasio and Claudia Morales. We said, suggested uh, we wanted to analyze governance for the provision of evidence in climate action and its diversity. Two different cases, Chile and Bolivia. And we'd like to uh, tri uh, trigger this topic. What can we have in common between the Yapacami in Bolivia and the Patagonian ice caps in Chile? Both are great examples of how climate surveillance has a positive effect on climate uh, for climate action and the protection of communities when it comes to climate change. Uh, the Yopacamani combine this surveillance with ancestral uh, practices in order to protect uh, crops 24 hours a day, uh, and they prevent uh, different types of harm. Also, climate surveillance through the scientific monitoring of glaciers allows us to uh, avoid uh, human losses, given the glacier make waters that quickly flood the uh, the houses of people living there. These are downstream flows. Both cases show the evidence of using evidence for climate action. And there are also examples that highlight the diversity of evidence. Both highlight that a lot of evidence can be used to inform public policy making. We aim to highlight the importance of, of having institutional arrangements that will allow us so to have different fora for to inform policy making. That's what our work focuses on. And it's important to increase the action of uh, evidence production to make knowledge available and to create commitments. For, commitment for the future. Bolivia and Chile are interesting examples of two different types of institutional arrangements. Bolivia has a originally uh, original uh, indigenous platform created by law, and this is a formal space for the participation of local communities and indigenous peoples. Also, Chile has uh, a committee to provide uh, scientific advice on climate change as created by law. What the committee uh, says will be used for public policy making purposes on climate change. Uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, NDCs and long term climate strategy. Um, it's clear that governments we need it's important to help people organize themselves and knowledge systems to organize themselves, but also governments need to create formal uh, spaces to use evidence through institutional arrangements that are very specific so that we can ensure the impact of this knowledge, because this is probably that what happens uh, all the time. This is our worst pain, how we actually have an impact with the advice provided by using the knowledge we are promoting. This can guide how evidence is organized as provided by different knowledge systems. It's also important to remember that different, the different ways of producing knowledge require different types of institutional arrangements. Uh, this should be done in different ways and there should be, uh, they need to be uh, incorporated, as my colleague was saying.
Finally, something that we have learned along this um, fellowship is that diplomacy is important in this case because it can be a tool to facilitate communication and create a bridge between those that participate in uh, knowledge systems and those who develop public policies in each country where we are part of. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Karina Vega Villa. I am part of the group that will be talking about the impact of the Belen Declaration on Indigenous Communities and the use of natural resources. I am from Ecuador, but I work in the United States. Here, I also uh, also, the following people participated, Cristina Puller, Barbados, Marinela Ruiz, Mexico, Camilo de los Rios, Rueda, Colombia, and also Matias Mastrangelo from Argentina. According to the WWF, the Amazonia hosts over 34 million people that work in eight countries, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, Suriname, Venezuela, and French Guyana. In these countries, eight out of 10 inhabitants uh, belong to 350 indigenous peoples and community. They are leading global, global environmental change and they have warned us that the Amazon is now reaching uh, the point, uh, a tipping point. Science keeps supporting their observations. Ecosystem degradation, deforestation and contamination uh, associated with minerals and oil is now a daily reality for indigenous and local communities in the Amaz Amazonia. This is why indigenous peoples can and must contribute their experience as experts in public uh, spaces that address the conservation of the Amazon. The participation of indigenous and local communities was one of the aims of the Belen Declaration, a multinational agreement that promotes sus the sustainable development of Amazon territories in these eight countries. Uh, in preparation for the Belen Declaration, August 2023, representatives from the civil society included in including national and indigenous peoples participating in the Amazon conversations to provide uh, their recommendations to heads of states. After this declaration, indigenous and local communities have uh, expressed their disagreement regarding what they feel is a lack of represent authentic representativeness of their recommendations in the final drafting of the agreement. In theory, the declaration addresses the uh, indigenous concerns. However, we are not sure that the visions and recommendations of the indigenous peoples are represented in practice. Leaders such as Fanny Cuido Castro from the Witoto pe people in Colombia have said that hydrocarbons and oil uh, truly affect the health of the indigenous peoples and communities, especially in Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, and Brazil. And uh, the commitments are not clear, in, and indigenous peoples are treated just indirectly. Other indigenous leaders have also expressed their concerns. In this context, we make recommendations so that indigenous peoples and nationalities be considered, uh, be truly and formally considered in developing, in implementing the Belen Declaration. This means that the agency in charge of the implementation called 
ACTO needs to select methodologies that accurately reflect the perspectives and views of the indigenous and local populations in the uh, uh, Amazon strategic cooperation agenda. We reached this conclusion after conducting an analysis in different areas. We have interviewed the coordinator of the leading agency. We have also conducted a literature review, including scientific journals, media articles, case studies, and indigenous community blogs. We analyzed the, the policy document and we also reviewed the full policy. This image is a result of the text exploration that assesses the frequency of the words. The more frequently a word is used, the bigger it appears on the image. We qualitatively analyzed the, uh, the text of the Belen Declaration. And you can see that the larger word largest word is Amazon, followed by development, sustainable, indigenous, traditional, and people. All these words are used quite often. This scientific analysis showed that we need to implement a comprehensive and collaborative approach that creates a culturally safe forum to bridge the gap between the language in the declaration and the implementation of the recommendations so that indigenous and local communities are actually visible in practice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim, and all the fellows. It has been truly interesting to hear what you have to say from every part of the continent. You've talked about so many different topics, oceans, food security, indigenous peoples, AI, loss and damage, urban green infrastructure, evidence for climate action, and with a running a thread, uh, one health, which is the planet's health, which is our health. For the final session of this first segment, we have the um, discussion panel on the importance of scientific evidence in de developing and implementing public policies. I would like to invite Dr. Anna Stewart to the stage because she will be moderating this panel and she will be inviting the panelists. Thank you. Buenas tardes a todos y todas. Perfecto. Good afternoon, everyone. We have experts uh, from different authorities. I would like to reflect on the nexus between science and policy and the, cha the challenges we're facing today in the Americas. And this is one of my passions. I have worked for many years as a scientist in the nexus between climate and health, and I'm so happy to learn from these colleagues. But before that, I would like to once again give a round of applause to all the fellows that have made a presentation today. They have done uh, an amazing job. Some of them have worked for over two years in teams. So it's great to learn from you. I would like to briefly introduce my panelists and we can start and we can listen to your contributions. Here we have the Vice Minister of Human Natural Resources and Climate Change, Christina Bailey. We have the Vice Minister of Regulation, Surveillance and Control of Health, Cesar Conde. Uh, we already know our distinguished Dr. Hajika, Director of Lance Account on South America and Professor at the Peruvian University, Caetano Heredia, 
Luis Escobar, friend and colleague as well, professor, assistant professor at the Virginia Tech University, associated with the Global um, uh, Change Center in the same university, and Dr. David Moran. He's a professor of uh, in the area of zoonosis at Bachelor of Guatemala University. We'll have a brief round of questions asked to the panelists with specific questions. I would like to ask the panelists to tell us, share with us some uh, anecdotes, clear examples uh, of success stories and failures as well. What works, what doesn't work. First of all, let's listen to our colleague, the Vice Minister of, uh, of Re uh, Surveillance and Regulation, Cesar. Can you tell us which climate information is being used or is needed to uh, uh, address the growing threats of climate change in, in, to health in Guatemala? Thank you. Thank you. In the first place, I want to thank the authorities of the university for organizing this forum. Thank you for inviting me. And also great greetings from the minister who was not, Oscar Cordon, who was not able to join us today. It is very important to discuss this issue. I think Guatemala is lagging quite behind in terms of the climate approach and the impact on health. The Ministry of Health for many years, for many decades, has been seen as a ministry that whose only intention is to heal people. And it has disregarded prevention, adopting a one health approach that includes animal health and environmental health and the impact on human health. It's a pressing matter, something that we need to include in our health system. To answer your question, I think that the Ministry of Public Health across its risk management and epidemiological system is not taking into account all the existing models, information like the one that was just mentioned, where we have scientific and academic evidence that would allow us to create monitoring strategies. As I said before, the ministry mainly focuses on solving health issues when many times behind the health issues, there was succession of events that led us there. And just to conclude, I, I, I know you, you mentioned that it was a four minute response we are now adopting, or this administration is now adopting an interdisciplinary approach under the One Health approach, providing the legal, political, and administrative framework to put together task forces with the Ministry of Public Health, Natural Resources, and the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock. And a good example of a zoonosis that just affected us was the Guillain-Barré symptom associated to Hyctelobacter. This is something that now this week, after having 90 cases and five deaths, we can say that it's now under control. Thank you, Ministry. It is inspiring to hear that you are now working on these multidisciplinary groups, integrating scientific knowledge. Now, for Vice Minister Bailey, from the perspective of the Ministry of Environmental Resources, we hear how important intersectoral approaches for the health and, and environmental issues are. So what do you think about these progress in national adaptation plans and how does the National Metrology Service can come together with the health sector and other stakeholders to develop such plans? Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. 
and the challenges are quite significant. These type of decisions on what to do is something that should bring different sectors together to identify priority strategies and work together. As the fellows mentioned before me, Maria or Carlos, one of the most important aspects is how to allow for indigenous representatives to set at the table from an equal standpoint and make their contributions. In Guatemala, we have the National Climate Change Council that brings different sectors to the table, making decisions on what we need to do. We have four task forces on adaptation, governance, mitigation, cooperation, and see how those we can tackle those challenges together, but we also have the Guatemalan science sector. We have other sectors working on some indicators on how science uh, can contribute with data. It's also important that the data that we have in the country are many times scattered, are not up to date, so that is a barrier for decision making. It's a risk that we have to tackle as a country. So together with the different universities, research institutes, we can access the most suitable data, data that is up to date, that will allow us to make informed decision. Dr. Hattinger, for example, spoke about water quality. In Central America, we have an average figure. In Guatemala, I can say that as from the Ministry of Environment, we just found that there is no institutional lab laboratory to measure water quality. So we only have scattered data here and there from some universities but there is no network providing official data to provide ongoing data on the quality of our air and, well, the repercussion that it has on health, of course. So we are working towards building a lab for measuring air quality and having the necessary equipment. So that is just one of the many examples that we could name. And well, those are some of the priorities of our, our ministry. Right, and that makes me think about how important it is to invest in comprehensive surveillance systems with information about water quality, water quality, climate, human and animal health, among other indicators. And that is a challenge, not just in Guatemala, but how can we create interoperable data platform, not just in Guatemala. I think that this is the same conversation that we are now having in other, in other countries as well. Many of the technological uh, advances uh, allow us to make big leaps in, the, in in different sectors. Dr. Ortinger, Guatemala has seven air quality monitoring units, two in the capital, and the other five across different uh, departments. So it's only seven in the entire country. So there is no information. We have seven in Lima. Only in Lima, we have seven, but none in the rest of the country. So we are in a similar position. So now we will hear from the representatives from the academia. A few weeks ago, I, I met with different colleagues to work on climate ser services for health. And at the time, a colleague, well, she was just receiving a report that they launched last year on climate services for health. 
And the figures that really keeps her up at night is that at global level, they did different surveys and show that 75% of meteorological services report providing some type of environmental information to the public health sector. Only one fourth, 25% of the ministries report that they actually use that information that was reported. So there is a big gap. We know there are more and more models, more and more indicators that are not perfect, but we conducted two years ago a literature review on models on infectious diseases. We looked at 9,500 articles worldwide. We found 38 potential tools for decision-making, and actually only five of them might be in use. So my question to researchers is, in your experience, what do we need to take these tools in indicators to the public sector, do you have examples of what has worked and what has not worked? Stella first, then David, and then Luis. Well, first, well, to tell you that anecdote, Anna, a few weeks ago, Richard Horton from The Lancet published an op-ed that says a formula for science is to write paper, to have a Zoom meeting, inviting a lot of people, and then maybe a press release. And that is the formula for scientists, check. And that was good criticism because that's what we are also doing. So what we can do for science, what works and what doesn't work, I would say that what works are events like this. That's why we've decided to go to the different countries and not just stay in the South finding strategic allies like you, visit countries in person so we can look at decision makers uh, face to face to put them on the spot and to say, well, these are the gaps that we have. This is the information that we have available. Tell us what you need so we can also help. Because the purpose of the academia is to provide information, to provide information and to give it to decision makers. So that is, one of the the first sort of notions that drew our attention and has allowed us to change our, our path. And what you've done with students is great as well. With regards to data and indicators, the Lancet report shows good things and bad things. The good things about the Lancet report is that provides an overview of what's happening right now. What we see in these five working groups, impact, mitigation, economy, and uh, political public changes to provide this type of information. What are the restrictions? The database needs to have a nationwide scope, not a subnational scope. We cannot just speak about rural urban areas. We cannot just speak about gender. So that's where the data, the restrictions around data comes in. And that's where researchers come in in the countries? How do we develop, develop case studies where we can take that data to a level that allows us to work as well? So that is something positive, I think, Anna. And then we spoke about the climate resilience health system, and that is what we need in the region. So all the information that we have, so Brazil is the only one that has an observatory that works where data on the environment and health works and it's real-time information. In Argentina, we have an early warning system for heat, for temperature only, but that's it. So what do we need in the region? We need for all environment ministry, public health ministries to connect, to design models. This is happening in Brazil already. So why shouldn't, why can't we just adopt them or start little by little in one region in the country and then expand it? Because if we create models, but we don't implement it, well, we just have something pretty to look at. Hello, it's my pleasure to be here. Four minutes, that's it. That's all I have. Okay, four minutes. I will start with an anecdote. 
we organize a lot of workshops on what we do to tackle zoonosis, to integrate the zoonosis data that is produced by academia. What we do as scientists, as academics, uh, will be used by the system. If I, for example, where we take uh, this or mosquitoes, people love mosquitoes or dogs or this or that, but we never consider because of the academic bias that we have, is what we need to really be able to answer all questions and to uh, produce change in public policy, which is the ultimate goal. It is great to have a publication, it is great to have uh, figures and Zoom presentations, but unless we impact public policy, we really are doing nothing. People will continue to get sick. They are not going to heal just by reading a paper. We need to produce changes in public policies. And and Luis has a lot of expertise. We might design many models. We know which model adapts better to the different conditions. But if we don't understand the country conditions, if we don't validate the models by actually implemented in the real systems, we will never get there. I remember a discussion with some Mexican colleagues that said that the best political system to produce change and knowledge in healthcare is that the health system will require it. So what do we need from this community? What data are we lacking? So let's go back to what you said earlier. If there is no funding, it will not work. If we don't fund studies that are based on country needs, or well, international academic sector will come and say, this is the model that works in our country. Will it work in yours? Well, who would like to test it? Where's the money coming from? So I participated earlier today in another discussion forum with the Ministry of Public Health, Culture, and Environment discussing exactly this. How do we actually implement the data that is produced by, by science? So how do we close that gap? Well, I think that what we're doing here today and a lesson from the pandemic is that we need to work together from the beginning, generate research questions from the beginning, considering environmental aspects, because we are all standing on the same ground, breathing the same air, drinking the same water, and even have the same text. And I will stop here because we only, I only had four minutes. <clears throat> I can think of three examples for science to be used for decision making. One in Chile. In Chile, they say we need to know what's happening. This is the data. And we told them what was going on. Another one in Ecuador, in the province of Chincha, they wanted to know what was going on in their municipality in terms of climate change and households, we told them what was going on. They didn't like what we said. They were expecting a different answer. And in the US, they asked us to check whether what they were doing was right or wrong. We looked at data, we told them, and they were happy with what they heard. It was satisfactory because they used our science. But one of the restrictions as a member of the academic world or how my boss will assess me is where am I publishing these results? I mean, those studies were quite small, they were quite local and probably will be of no use to someone in Japan that has a similar problem, but the situation is completely different. So we always try that the bigger, the more attractive projects that are going to be widely quoted. For example, am I, being, I'm being qualified as to how many times my papers are being quoted, not about the municipalities that I worked with. So these municipalities were quite small, the funds were quite small, and my boss, of course, is happier when I bring big money, not small money. Many times the big research labs will choose the, the big bags of money, so we are speaking about different studies that will probably take longer to have an impact at the local level. So when impacting or when 
influencing decision makers, maybe we shouldn't be just ambitious and look at publications impact and funds and rather go for the more local impact. Let's have a final reflection and maybe we have a time for, for two questions from the audience and from our panelists as well. We can start on this side. Given everything we've heard this afternoon, which is your burning takeaway that you want to communicate to the audience, which is the most urgent thing? I think that we need to uh, get this running, this approach running. So we need to include local communities. That's essential. In the case of Guatemala, we will achieve this uh, if we have a healthy democracy. Uh, if you're not from Guatemala, you might not know this, but in the last 10 months in our national history, We've tried to defend our democratic, our democracy in order to guarantee transition uh, to the new administration. I think that this new administration is allowing us to implement this type of project that clearly would have been impossible with, with other administrations. So although it might not be uh, apparent, the political, um, situation very clearly affects us because it enables an, a healthy environment that will allow us to implement this type of project. And we need to uh, uh, include all this. So I, I share the, the importance of governance and political institutions. Yes, and actually this type of activity is very important to participate in. Thank you. Uh, I was here, I saw Andrea Romero tweeting what's happening and she's taking pictures as well. I think that's something that the academia has done terribly when it comes to scientific communication. I communicate what I do just in scientific meetings. And this is why we haven't been able to actually educate the community. The, the public. And this is why we have presidents like Trump and Bolsonaro that can actually sell this message of, uh, you know, denying climate change because scientists haven't taken the time to educate the public. Yes, the importance of science communication, that's essential. We also talked, we've said with Stella that scientists now need to be great scientists, communicators, they need to work on ethics, rights. And also, it's not that scientific, scientists need to be experts in everything, but they need to work in teams. Scientists and communicators need to be working together with others so that they have a greater impact. Yes. Um, I would love to have more than four minutes for this, but still, I think we should remember that we need to debate these things together and not, and not just physicians, chairs, veterinarians, no, everyone together. Uh, and you would be surprised, as I am surprised, how many times I participated in meetings and I go to the communities, I work with everyone. And sometimes you say, you know what happened? in this place with rabies and I don't know what. Yes, but that happens in Guatemala as well. So we, we can see that uh, science producing communities do not talk to each other. And we are relatively small as a community. In Guatemala, there are not so many scientists and sometimes we don't know what's happening in other parts of the country. I know that most people that are affected by diseases throughout the world that work with diseases do not work with climate people. So what happens with, with those people, with decision makers, if they, if they do not participate in our events, not necessarily science, what will happen? There might be a thousand wonderful solutions or models, but uh, we don't even know what's happening locally. So how can we influence other people? We will keep I don't know, trying to publish our articles, getting funds and all that. So we need to talk to each other. Let's communicate. Let's get to know other things. 
Yes, we've always said that we're not robots yet. We do need the human care of sharing, of creating connections, uh, talking and actually building uh, trust in order to make progress. Vice Minister, thank you. I would like to tell David that in my other life, I also work with insects, with mosquitoes. Uh, I'm not a tick uh, scientist. I think that something important that we have mentioned today is inclusion. Inclusion in the area of science data and decision making. I think that we have made quite a lot of uh, progress globally with gender, and that's great. In our current government, it's the first time we have the same number of female ministers and male ministers. Well, that's quite some progress. However, other things have to be done. We need to include uh, originary and indigenous peoples. And we also need to include different generations. I think that we need to involve young people, not, a, not as young as us, maybe slightly younger, uh, because they are the ones that will be making the decisions very soon. We're going out, you know, and they are decision makers. They need to have the, the right scientific data and they need to make that contribution that is needed when it comes to decision making. I think that that is uh, something we still need to do globally. Some countries have made some progress, but we still have a long way to go in Latin America and Central America. We need inclusion everywhere when it comes to information, data, decision making. Uh, thank you. Okay, the last one. I think you've mentioned everything, so I'll go back to the report. In my final slide on the report, I talk about public commitment and personal commitment. It includes five levels assessed, and, it's, and these are the main decision makers. We have the media that must help us communicate what we're doing. I uh, promise we try to include everything we do uh, to communicate it in a simple way. We prepare policy briefs, fact sheets, summaries in Spanish, Portuguese, English. We are still missing other languages, Quechua, Aymara, so the information reaches people. So the mass media are also committed. Regarding uh, social media, and this is people, us, we are working with social media. We're all experts now within social media. Uh, well, not me, but in any case, this is why I have Luciana and Camila. There is also misinformation and information. So we also need to be responsible as individuals. There's also the government. It's so great that we're all here today. Please, uh, we needed to invite ministers, vice ministers of health, of the environment. They need to effect the change. We're going to only provide the information, but we can listen. So if you need other things, please let us know so that we can help you. But we need also a financial commitment, a science office in Guatemala. In Peru, we have a CONCITEC. They provide the research funds that are not enough, but at least we have some research funds. There is also the commitment of uh, companies, and they also need to think about health and climate change. And I think that is my final reflection. It's not a tiny bit of society that needs to change. It's everyone, and we need to uh, encourage this change. Thank you. OK, two questions from the audience now. Edwin has a microphone. Bold. Anybody, anybody. <laughs> Two questions from the audience. I know it's been a very long day. Ha sido un día bien largo. Dos preguntas. Hay una pregunta aquí adelante, Edwin. Por favor. There's a question here at the front. Please raise your hand if you have a question, and we can choose question number two. 
Thank you. Good afternoon. I work at the Ministry of Health. And I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Stella Hartinger the following regarding the indicators that you have mentioned in your presentation. Do you think that maybe we need to add some indicators that have to do with uh, topics related to the possibility of or the proliferation of vectors causing rhizomoniasis, for instance. And that's just an example. Also, for instance, water, sanitation, and that has a lot to do with all this uh, to, to see if we're making progress or not. And the other question first, and then we can answer the questions. If you think we're running late, we're going to change the agenda a bit, so we're not running late. Don't worry. Thank you. I'm Pablo Prada. I'm a professor of the University of San Carlos. I have a question addressed to Luis and David. Uh, maybe Cristina would like to say something as well. This has to do with what we discussed with Jaime Carrera de Andívar. When we think about this, uh, uh, how academicians want to conciliate the depth of the knowledge created and its social relevance. And this is a sort of existential limbo. Uh, I was listening to the step fellows and I was thinking it's this is so interesting, but I had that role at some point in my life. And I remember I was so frustrated because in those foreign global summits, COPs, etc., many things are said, but very few materialize. So my question is, how do we strike a balance between academic depth, methodological rigor, and actually making significant contri contributions? Stella, and the second question. Hola, este para la doctora Marianela de México. Ah, so you step fellowship. I'm a step fellow from Mexico, Dr. Stella. It calls my attention that you say that academicians just provide information and that's all we do. I understand your position. That's our job. I study pharmacology. I'm a PhD student. I am doing this fellowship to break away from that paradigm. So, and I think that's one of the objectives of the fellowship, step fellowship for scientists to develop skills so that we can become policy, science policy makers uh, with the necessary background in order to address different topics. I studied dengue, for instance, and the and the vectors. I, I have some knowledge, but uh, and I, I don't want to brag, but I have the knowledge. So I need to learn how to develop public policies. But that's not all I would like to do, but because that's just another paper. We need strategies and programs that are effectively implemented. So that was my comment. Thank you. I'll start with that one. Thank you for your comment. It's exactly what you have said. And Anna talked about this as well. Scientists' roles are changing. We're not just producing uh, evidence. And that's true. And as Christina said, maybe we are a different generation. And you see science from a comprehensive perspective. When I was taught, I was taught to communicate science, write a paper, maybe someone will read it. And it will get, I don't know how many hits. Uh, but you see things differently. And this is why the IAI is doing this a valuable work. You work in the era of environmental justice. You have a comprehensive perspective, and it's great for this program to be able to, uh, you know, go full circle. 
It's true. Scientists initially find it very hard to communicate. We talk about the confidence intervals and 95% and all that because we're afraid of being criticized. Someone might misinterpret what we're saying, etc. But it's great that that's changing. Regarding the question about more indicators, we would love to add more indicators. The thing is that this report is uh, uh, targets 195 countries and not all the countries have all the information we need to create the indicators. So we need at least information when when we create a new indicator, we need information about 100 countries, and then we need to reach the rest of the planet. And that's the objective here, that we can represent every country. Otherwise, we will just have regions with no information. There's a lot of regions that have no inf uh, information. Africa is, well, is, is a problematic one. Within Lancet, we also focus on case studies. We try to create these new indicators that might be able to, uh, uh, we might be able to address with different countries to provide information so that they become indicators at some point. Maybe someone else can answer question number two. Thank you, Stella. Sorry, I was just thinking about the answer and I've forgotten. Uh, in my work with municipalities and local governments or state governments and the World Bank, because we worked for them, for instance, they gave us symbolic money, <laughs> but they didn't want publications. They wanted a report and they would be happy with that. And that was easy. There was no review. This is it. There was no audit. But in in my country, they gave us money and they wanted a publication. And we said, why would you like a publication? You're the state. And they said, uh, we want to do this with the best science available. And we want uh, uh, we need to to get your work checked by scientific community. And that was good because governments provide funds, but they also want scientific rigor. That would be expected of any study. I really like that question because uh, in a way, we were trained under positivism, confidence interval, sample size, and all that. That's what they teach us, and we create science. We do science. However, we need to fill knowledge gaps, and we need solid evidence. That's what they teach us. But when we try to solve problems in particular, we, uh, uh, we're talking about uh, problems that come from uh, communities, or some conservation issues, we will try to be scientifically rig rigorous, but we need to try to understand the phenomenon observed so that we can answer a question. In the case of diseases in particular, many times, and this might sound strange, but scientific rigor is important because I also need to publish. If I don't publish, the donor will not provide any more funds and I will have many problems. But I'm really interested in understanding the origin of the problem I see, which are the true determinants of diseases. Is not, not if it's the virus, the vector, the tick, how the combination of all those elements at that specific time actually um, mean that a disease will take place or not, or how this can be changed so the disease doesn't happen anymore, we need to move somewhere else, etc. And this is what I aim to achieve so that people are, or animals do not get sick. And this is the aim of my program. Many times, scientific um, 
robustness is challenged because we need to, we might uh, think about qualitative methods. An example, where we're trying to evaluate why classical strategies uh, tested throughout the world regarding eliminating rabies in humans didn't work in Guatemala and it still doesn't work in uh, some way. We did everything people did, vaccination, surveillance, vaccinating dogs, uh, you know, uh, Ricardo Castillo says hi, by the way. And we worked in Guatemala, we compared it to our system to Peru, Peru, etc. But it didn't work. So we would ask people, did you get your dog vaccinated? And they, they said, no. The people at the vaccination station were not nice. So people didn't get their dogs vaccinated. Why? This was before the pandemic because they said the vaccines kill dogs. So you begin to understand that you can do science, you will find answers, but you need to go beyond that. You need to make sure you cover the population. Um, I'm going to study confidence intervals and all that, but then you forget that people, I don't know, don't want to take their dogs to get vaccinated because they have a, the wrong idea about vaccines. That's what we need to consider. And Luis will not agree with this. The models are very good. We have very solid data, but our country lacks that. We need to understand that this won't be uh, good material for publishing but then uh, it might be replicated in, under similar conditions for your region. Thank you so much. As you were saying, the IAI promotes transdisciplinary science. It's a number of researchers and experts in a uh, broadly speaking from the community, the public sector, the private sector from social science and also biophysics. Nowadays, the IAI funds, trains and supports TD science. We are now funding 12 projects with seed grants from 15 countries in the Americas to address different climate change and health topics in the regions. We have a gift for you, Stella, it's a double launch. It's a Lancet Accountant report published yesterday and available. And we're also launching this new IAI compendium by the IAI in Latin America, 21, Climate, Environment and Health, which is a compilation of articles written by scientists that were trained. And the, these were published as op-eds in the major journals in Latin America. English, Spanish, and Portuguese, and some of the authors are present here today. So this is a, an example of how we're working to strengthen communication, uh, science communication. Well, this is the end of this section. Thank you so much to our panelists.